Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's webinar and thank you for attending, especially those of you who are members of one of our institutions. My name is Dion Rowley and I will be acting in my capacity as chair for the Joint Institutions Lecture Series this evening. For those of you who may not be members, please follow the links below in the video or contact myself directly and we can give you information on how to join one of the three institutions. The Joint Institutions Lecture Series is a collaborative arrangement between the Institute of Engineering and Technology, Engineers Australia and the IEEE, where we work together to bring you a diverse programme of technical events and meetings to provide you with continuing professional development and networking opportunities. As the Joint Institutions, we aim to continue bringing you these events during the current restrictions for meetings and once we return to our usual auditorium in the city of Sydney in the CBD. Just before we start, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians of the land which we record the event today, the Camargo people of the Gurengai Nation, paying respect to elders both past, present and emerging. And it is upon their lands where we reside as we share our knowledge, teachings and learnings today. We may also pay our respects to the traditional knowledge embedded forever into the land by the Aboriginal people. For the purposes of the live presentation, all participants will be asked to mute their microphones and we encourage you all to submit any questions that you may have using the chat box provided. For those of you who may be watching this event as a recorded session later, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, which will address some of the questions raised during the live event. Tonight, we are privileged to have David Yuono with us, who will be talking about his progressive work in the field of 5G networking standards relating to IoT devices. David has a Master of Digital Communications degree and over 12 years experience in the field of carrier grade wireless and sensor technologies and networks from the telecommunications industry. David now leads the Internet of Things practice at Optus. Optus is an Australian leader in integrated communications, serving over 10 million customers each day. The company provides a broad range of telecommunications services with a strong focus in fostering growth in the Australian IoT ecosystem. Well, that's enough of me talking. I'm sure you're here to hear David's great presentation. So if you would please welcome David to the stand, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a privilege to be here and sharing a little bit about um, our emerging work in IoT and 5G uh, at Optus. My name is David Iwono. I am a principal architect in mobile infrastructure as well as director of the Internet of Things practice with Optus. Um, so tonight we will look into um, how 5G will impact the Internet of Things growth or, or how 5G standards can actually help to accelerate um, Internet of Things adoption in various industries and markets. Um, we'll be looking at um, obviously to start with 5G itself, the why, what and how of 5G. Um, then we'll move into the current state of play of Internet of Things and some diagnosis around um, whether it had been uh, successful, scaled or not, uh, as well as looking at um, early signals and emerging use cases in the field of Internet of Things. Um, as we look into the reason um, on 5G itself, why do we have 5G? Why um, do we, the industries and the organizations actually um, develop 5G standards? It is actually to enable Industry 4.0. Uh, Industry 4.0 itself um, is basically, in short, um, a digitalization of everything, um, process, asset, and people. Um, around workplaces, around different types of uh, vertical industries. And it doesn't actually start and end with 5G. 5G is just one of its enabler. Um, 5G provides um, um, benefits like ultra low latency, high bandwidth, network size architecture, and support of millions uh, or massive penetration of machine type communications. 
Um, but in order for us to actually really embark into Industry 4.0, um, we will also need the other enabling pillars. Those are digitalization, so end-to-end -end service chaining, being able to do for a network to do self-configuration and self-adaptation uh, of functionalities, zero touch, the adoption of AI on real-time machine learning algorithms, automation and predictive analytics, as well as um, full migration to cloud architecture, which will provide us with scalability, reliability, availability, agility, and speed. Um, so as we agreed on why 5G is important to actually enable Industry 4.0 or accelerate Industry 4.0 adoption, um, we should look into what are the 5G building blocks? What makes up 5G? What can be called 5G in terms of uh, from a standards perspective? Now, ITUT, um, um, International Telecom Union, have defined the high-level requirements for next-generation mobile system in their ITU 2020 um, um, uh, paper. Um, what it defines is um, an approach on four um, main parameters as the objectives of 5G. First parameter is capacity. So the ability for a system or for a wireless system to support 10 gigabit per second big data rates, um, as well as 1 million uh, devices per, per square kilometer. The next parameter is latency. So the ability to actually uh, reduce latency to a point of less than one millisecond uh, uh, in, 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 in the radio layer. Um, also, the ability to support 100 megabit per second average speed, wherever it's required. The third parameter is reliability. This is to support mission critical and ultra reliable uh, use cases. Um, so the requirement is for, to have zero mobility interruption, as well as um, um, 10 to the, to the scale of uh, minus six end to end outage. Um, the last parameter is connectivity, and that comes in two factor. Uh, one is 10 years of battery life, as well as reduce device cost um, to support massive machine to machine communications. Now, how this standard is then adopted in, in, into a wireless standard is uh, led by 3GPP in its release 15 um, um, discussions. Um, 3GPP came out with the new radio and next generation core requirements. Um, that includes um, standards and protocols like millimeter waves. So the ability to access, to access spectrum beyond um, 60 gigahertz that, that we are seeing today with 4G technologies, small cell, uh, massive MIMO, beamforming, and full duplex. Um, so knowing all those capabilities from 5G, um, how do we see this being applied in terms of um, actual use cases or what, how can we expect that 5G itself will, with all of those parameters, can actually support adoption of especially Internet of Things or machine-to-machine -machine technologies? Um, 5G can be applied to uh, three different segments. Um, the first segment is human to human, and this is no different um, to 4G, for example, where it will enable communications like video call or virtual meeting that we're having today on only in greater speed and greater bandwidth. It will provide um, um, support to much more wearable devices. So not just uh, smart watches, but also uh, uh, potentially everything that we wear can be connected. Um, then it will also support um, public safety use cases through its ultra reliable low latency communications. Um, moving to the second segment, um, 5G will enable human to machine communications more. It could be in the form of fixed wireless, basically broadband replacement. So instead of having to rely on fiber and ADSL and copper to connect fixed connectivity, um, it will be done over wireless communications instead. It'll provide more support on smart homes, um, monitoring of healthcare, potentially um, remote surgery, as well as uh, V2X or ve vehicle to X communications. Now in a machine to machine space, which we'll be focusing today, um, 
5G will then provide um, constant streaming of video monitoring uh, and the application of, for example, facial recognition or object detection or anomaly detection on top of video monitoring. It will provide um, a much greater access to mobile cloud computing where most of the applications that enterprises will use will reside on the cloud. Um, then it will provide um, reliable or mission critical communications through vehicle to things or vehicle to a smart transport grid, for example, vehicle to vehicle uh, will, 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 will be fully autonomous uh, driving as well as industrial automation. Now, as we look into um, IoT itself, when we're talking about IoT, um, the first thing that comes to mind is basically um, industrial Internet of Things. So everything that is now cabled and connects over um, 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 fiber or connects over ethernet or connects over um, a string of uh, copper um, will be replaced by wireless sensors. Um, but when 5G comes, the application of IoT can actually be expanded to more than just um, sensor replacement, for example, or, or making sensor wireless. Um, it, can, it, it can be categorized to four different applications of IoT. The first one is massive IoT, which is as we discuss, it's focusing on um, making sensors connected, cameras connected, um, logical controls like PLC connected. Um, and this is probably no different to how we use 4G and LPWA today, technologies, and technologies like MDIoT. How 5G can then um, help accelerate IoT is to move beyond massive IoT. It will move into broadband uh, Internet of Things, so applications like AR and VR, as well as 4K and 8K streaming and, 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 and content um, um, generation. Um, move into critical IoT, which is fully autonomous vehicle, um, collaborative uh, robotics, so uh, control of robots that is using um, wireless protocol. Um, and then it can finally move into a fully realized industrial automation IoT. Um, this could actually mean um, remote control of different types of vehicles and robotics, um, a medical diagnosis that can be done remotely um, over medical devices and adaptive uh, grid systems. Um, and, and 5G will enable this by uh, two factors. One is a decreasing um, in its latency. Uh, so from 10 seconds, for example, all the way to 10 microseconds, as well as increase in bandwidth from one kbps all the way to 10 gbps. Um, and as 5G is evolving, um, so the way 5G is being implemented by most networks today is um, basically a deployment of 5G radio with 4G core. This is called a non-standalone um, model. It is using a 4G EPC um, and anchoring into an LT base station. Um, so the use cases that can be realized for this is actually quite limited because the fact that the core network itself is still running on 4G standards. Uh, as we evolve the network, um, 5G will adopt dual mode 4G and 5G core. So um, the 5G core itself will be overlaid on top of 4G network. And with this model, which is basically um, option number three and option number two. Um, we can support much more bandwidth heavy applications like AR and VR, as well as some level of mission criticality. Now in its end state, 5G will be fully standalone. And when this happens um, in the next 18, 24 months, in, in terms of maturity, uh, 5G will be able to support network slicing as well as um, SLA-based um, uh, uh, service delivery. Um, with SLA-based service delivery, then this is the time when we can expect applications like um, emission critical applications like autonomous vehicle or fully um, automated industrial IoT. 
um, it is also important to understand that um, in order to support the high bandwidth uh, nature of 5G, um, the system itself needs to access a much bigger um, asset of spectrum. Um, so as you can see in this slide here, a comparison of how wide the spectrum is um, has a direct impact in terms of coverage. So in order to realize the 10 gigabits per second peak throughput, uh, 5G needs to access spectrum in a millimeter wave space. So that is basically beyond 6 gigahertz. Now, the issue with this is um, the higher the frequency is, then the worse the propagation is and, 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 and the more um, sensitive it is to interference. So in terms of a coverage comparison, we'll see that a 5G running millimeter wave um, can cover half a kilometer um, of, um, of cell coverage compared to two to three kilometers if it's running 4G today. Um, so deployment of the system will have to rely heavily on small cells. Um, where are we now? Um, in 2020, um, we have seen a number of carriers globally, um, including Optus um, here in Australia, um, that has started to deploy 5G standalone to enable low latency mass connectivity and ultra reliability. This is at the back of um, three to five years worth of 5G testing and early launches in 2019. Um, and we are expecting to see uh, mission critical use cases to start appearing as the devices are getting, uh, as the ecosystem becoming more mature in 2021 onwards. Now that we understand what 5G is and how 5G can enable um, or accelerate IoT deployment, we need to look into the state of IoT um, application or IoT deployment, especially in Australia. A survey that um, Optus and Informa has done in 2019 uh, actually shows um, uh, this is a feedback from different enterprises uh, from direct survey or, or interview that Informa and Optus have done. Um, out of all the surveyors, 61% um, of enterprises claims that they are already connected. And this can be in various forms of connectivity. Could be internet connectivity, um, some are exploring uh, or demigrating to cloud, could be uh, mobile first, um, but only 24% um, actually understand the value of being a data first enterprise. But what's more concerning is um, only 13% of such enterprises um, claimed that um, they are secure. So uh, this means that the, 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 the big majority of connected enterprise are not actually securing their access to data. Um, and only 2% actually claims that they are a cognitive enterprise. Cognitive enterprise means uh, they are able to use the data that they collect and analyze into action. Um, so only 2% out of the companies that, has, that, that, that were surveyed um, have been able to really um, activate values from their IoT uh, devices or IoT networks. Um, and we expect or anticipate that IoT adoption or being connected um, um, is, is important and is becoming easier today. And we can look into different factors to explain why. Um, um, and, and a number of reasons. So, so first reason is we are seeing more powerful, smaller processing units. So seven to 10 nanometer processors um, enable processing at the edge um, in a very, uh, very small form factor device. So this enables that um, a device to be much more complex, but much more powerful as well in terms of its processing capability. 
uh, we're seeing SOC-based devices um, are beginning more and more common. This enables flexibility and lower cost of hardware R&D and hardware creation. Um, from a network perspective, um, low power wide area network standards like NB-IoT and LTM has lowered the cost of device because the module is made um, in, 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 in massive volume, there's economies of scale, as well as the complexity of the device is reduced to enable low cost um, modules. We are seeing accelerated cloud adoption. So more and more applications and processing are actually moving to the cloud um, and the ability to actually have a um, big pipe going into the, part, into the cloud means that um, it's getting easier to actually onboard devices to talk to cloud ap um, applications. We're seeing API-based developments um, um, becoming more of a standard and um, protocols like, um, and standards like RESTful, RESTful API allows low bandwidth and lightweight applications to be, to be built. Um, and then we're looking at um, innovation in serverless technologies um, like containers and pop and sub protocols, as well as um, actually the cost to access a network has dropped significantly in the last five to six years. That's because of 4G and its um, technology evolution, for example, it has reduced the dollar per, per BPS uh, metric to actually access a network. But understanding all those enablers, um, the promise of a 50 billion device connected that we are all talking about in 2010 hasn't been realized. Um, the latest stats that I've seen from various analysts and reports are showing an IoT device penetration or connection penetration of about uh, 15 to 16 billion. So we fall short to the prediction. And, and why, why is that? Um, there's a couple of reasons that we, we have been exploring or as, as, um, as contributors in Optus. One is lack of endpoint management. This goes back to the survey that um, a lot of the connectivity that um, companies and organizations are using are not secure or they don't even know if they're secure. Um, and it's because OT applications or uh, OT devices um, are actually not fit or they don't fit into the greater IT framework uh, of an enterprise. Um, and because of that, uh, it doesn't fit the, the cybersecurity plan framework and strategy of such enterprise. And this um, causes um, organizations to delay or postpone or cancel IoT projects. Um, second, we, we, we're seeing uh, a lot of fragmentation in IoT solutions themselves. Um, so the IoT market is full of niche solutions that address specific problems. Uh, and because of that, um, this creates um, a trend of shadow ITs. Um, where organizations have smaller group of um, sort of stakeholders that adopts IoT solutions just for a particular function. And they don't always fit with the strategic nature um, or framework of such enterprise. Uh, for example, you may adopt um, a, a vehicle telemetry solution uh, for compliance purpose, that it captures everything that you need to know for compliance. You need to report the health of the vehicles, uh, the vehicle fleet that you have, it, it will report um, um, dangerous driving um, uh, behaviors, et cetera. But um, this solution cannot be integrated or adapted or combined with other data sets. And that is because um, as what the survey suggested, a lot of companies, they uh, don't have cohesive data strategy. They don't uh, put data at the first um, a, a, a point uh, or the first priority of the enterprise strategy. And this, is, this makes things difficult to implement IoT solutions um, and it will foster tactical approach instead of strategic data first approach. Um, lastly, we're seeing a fragmentation in terms of protocols that are used as well. Um, with IoT, especially with a, a number of OT applications, uh, we have to work with um, 
um, protocols that were not designed for cloud, were not designed to be carried on IP, it wasn't designed to be analyzed and um, um, and put into um, a, a machine learning algorithm, for example. Protocols like Canvas or SCADA, which uh, does it work as, as a uh, sort of control, uh, control focus protocol, um, but it needs a lot of adaptation to ensure that the data that's carried through the protocol can actually be ingested into a single data repository. Um, we're also seeing implementation of uh, protocols like MQTT, which has been very loose. Um, the, 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 the protocols themselves are standard and it's really easy to scale, um, but it carries uh, a, a, a very, uh, very much whatever the designer of the, um, of the message wants it to be. So it's very hard to standardize um, and then translate it into common data um, uh, database. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of proprietary protocols where I can, um, um, I can design a new protocol for IoT called David Protocol, for example. It, it will be very different to what everyone else is, is writing and coding. And hence, um, it makes things difficult and expensive to be um, analyzed and integrated together as well. Um, so what do we need to do? Knowing that 5G can accelerate IoT adoption through its uh, capability to support millions of devices per kilometer square, um, but if we don't um, somehow come with the standard framework um, um, to better manage, secure, and um, analyze data that are coming from IoT solutions and IoT devices, then we will still um, stuck in the same problem. Um, so the way we see it is uh, we need to build multiple bridges or connectors. Um, knowing the variety of devices, knowing the variety of networking technologies that these devices connect to, could be wireless, could be unlicensed, could be fixed. Um, um, every IoT device needs to be connected and integrated to a common platform. And the platform uh, needs to function as device manager. It needs to function as network manager, as well as connectivity manager. And once that happens, then um, the ability for higher, la uh, higher layer ap applications like um, rating, charging, billing, uh, application development, work workflow management, and API exchanges can actually be applied to into a common platform. Um, once we do that, then building or developing applications like smart buildings, smart city, connected vehicles can be done on the same environment. Um, and once it's done on the same environment, then we can apply smart logics like analytics, we can visualize it, and most importantly, we can apply um, exception um, handling so that um, the promise of through IoT, which is basically to to be a uh, to, to head into the cognitive cycle, to learn from what the data is telling um, telling the system about, and and action it um, into either a predictive trending, or or into um, um, or or into a, a, an insight that uh, an algorithm really value uh, can be made a reality. So so what what. What does it mean um, in terms of that common platform? How do we make it ready for 5G, for example? Um, our approach is um, the platform needs to be programmable, autonomous, and closed loop. It, it will have to be event driven. Um, it'll have to understand what type of data coming from what type of devices and learn um, or understand from such information. Um, auto provision, define, configure, um, that it can be fully programmable, it can be closed loop, action, um, and monitored. Once it's actually action and monitored, it can analyze and recommend um, self changes and optimization through the whole cycle behavior. Um, so this is really important um, in order to really get value out of the data IoT solutions and systems are collected. 
So what, what can we expect moving forward? What are emerging um, coming out in the world of 5G and IoT? Um, we can expect more real-time interactions with various types of sensors that are becoming more ubiquitous in our lives. Um, in this page, you can see uh, an imagination of um, an assisted or connected driving experience where information can be presented on a vehicle windscreen using micro transparent light display uh, technology. Um, it can display on demand information such as navigation. It can display alerts such as, um, for example, um, um, hazards that's actually blocking your way or people crossing the road that can be a safety hazard. It can display information um, such as a promotional um, a campaign um, to actually buy a goods or services. Um, it can also display real-time information like, um, for example, stock exchange if you um, see on the screen. And, and much more interestingly, as we look at the, the second trend is that the, the dominant uh, form of communications between a human and machine will be in the shape of voice. Um, so the inputs to the systems um, are no longer based on touch or gesture, but uh, will, be, will be more and more based on voice. As we've seen in the adoption of virtual digital assistants, um, Google has basically reached the threshold of human accuracy in 2017. And we're seeing more and more um, this type of interaction will, um, will power um, the human and machine interaction. Um, we'll also be seeing um, uh, uh, min miniaturization of um, sensors that can actually be worn on people. Um, and this can be used, for example, for paper use or micropayments, authentication. Um, when we're going into a museum or a movie theater, for example, instead of having to pay in advance, um, you, can, you can pay for actual use. When you enter a gallery in a museum, um, you will charge, you'll be charged accordingly to, to, to that content instead of paying um, a full access to the museum up front. Um, we'll, be, we'll also be seeing adoption or integration of um, um, health or vital sign monitoring um, devices or sensors into day-to-day um, -day, um, appliances or, or, or day-to-day furniture um, and in, 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 house, in, in homes, into, into bathrooms and um, bedrooms, for example, and being used to actually monitor um, and log um, vital signs. Um, and, and this is for early detection of diseases um, and, and trending of um, terminal cases. Um, the, the next trend we're seeing is the use of camera to actually replace the sensors. So camera uh, or analytics um, engine and logics built into cameras can replace various different sensors like temperature, humidity, vibration. Um, and, and this allows for a much more uh, streamlined um, IoT implementation. Instead of having to deploy um, dozens or hundreds of sensors, it can be replaced with uh, multiple cameras collecting data, um, um, a multiple stream of data together. Um, and, and we're seeing this um, in, in um, some of the trials that AT&T um, have done with Amazon, for example. Um, we will also see the, the use of um, high bandwidth imaging application in construction industry and projects. So the use of uh, uh, robots that, <clears throat> that has built in LiDAR and radar sensor to actually sense um, into a construction site and in real time um, comparing um, the measurement with um, the design of such construction site. This is um, to prevent expensive errors um, and misalignment and, and, and um, um, uh, low quality uh, or quality control into construction sites. 
um, and, and in order to be rectified um, when the building or site is being constructed rather than after the fact, after everything is completed. Um, closer to the current uh, pilot, uh, we, 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 Dubai Airport, for example, have already adopted facial recognition for border control. And of course, in, in, in the um, sort of COVID-19 um, environment and climate that we're, we're, we're in today, um, the use of such camera for temperature uh, sensing and measurement has also been widely adopted um, in, in, in various different sites. Um, in terms of pilot as well, um, it's also, uh, we're seeing combination of data that I, uh, an IoT sensor or device is collecting um, can be combined with um, AR and VR technology, for example. So um, instead of sending um, high value expensive uh, subject matter experts uh, for repair or, or maintenance, um, it can actually be done from a control center remotely uh, sent through uh, an AR Google uh, that will be able to display images and instruction and guides from such subject matter expert in the control center, as well as in real time collecting um, data from sensors that are all around the maintenance or, 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 or the site that it's being serviced on um, in order to provide um, safety information um, into the field force. What Optus has been done as well is um, in, in a more practical term um, using um, information collected from people counting uh, systems, uh, combining this with a digitally controlled um, um, HVAC system um, in order to save um, or to, to reduce and optimize energy consumption. And by doing so, um, a building can be um, um, smartly programmed to adjust the temperature according to the number of people within the space. Um, um, combining this with um, a vital sign sensors like heart rate, um, um, for example, or, or breathing rate um, can further fine tune or optimize the use of air conditioning to make sure that the comfort level of people who's in the space is maintained. The same technology then um, can also be applied to um, um, artificial light control and optimization in order to actually reduce, um, again, the energy consumption of a particular side of a building. Um, and this can only be enabled, obviously, if um, all the data that are collected from various different uh, sensors and, 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 and system and solution um, can be accessed uh, via uh, a common platform and can be um, actually analyzed and sliced and diced um, in, um, into the common data repository and creating value for different enterprises and organizations. Thank you, and I hope that have been informative and useful for you. Um, again, um, it's been my privilege to share um, some of the work that we have done in the field of 5G and IoT. Um, and hopefully, um, you will find this session uh, useful um, in your technology journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was very interesting. It's amazing to see that our appetite for data and AR and all these new services and streaming is really driving the technology forward for 5G. So that's excellent to, to see. Well, I guess we have uh, some questions. So I think I shall take my uh, chairman's privilege and ask, ask the first question. And one of the things that springs to my mind is with regards, as I guess, as a comparison to the, the 4G that we're used to and the data rates that we're used to, how will 5G compare with regards to battery life, for example, on devices? It's obviously fantastic. We're going to get all this extra rich data, but will that be more or less efficient on the batteries? Um, uh, obviously, um, a, a battery life optimization is um, a function of how much processing or activity a device needs to do. And the, um, 
in, in IoT use cases where um, the data that are being transmitted are quite small, it requires almost no processing, um, then um, if it's being transported by the right transport channel, um, uh, it can help prolong a device's battery life. Now, in 4G, um, it cannot be natively supported because um, 4G in, in, in LTE, um, um, uh, per se, uh, is a protocol that carries, it's a broadband protocol. So it's not designed to actually carry small packets. Now, the evolution of 4G, um, uh, protocols like MB-IoT and LTM was then created in 3 gpp release uh, 13 and 14 to support small packet transport on LTE. Um, and, and now we have that capability in a 4G system. With 5G, then this logic or intelligence actually built natively into the 5G protocol itself. So instead of having to um, add on a new protocol like NB-IoT, 5G inherently understands um, or aware if a device needs to carry a big packet or a small packet and self-optimize itself. Um, so it then eventually help to uh, prolong a, a device battery life. Excellent, thank you. So it's uh, not only faster, but like I say, with the, the protocol, it's a much more efficient way of working because it's not running uh, flat out, I guess, as it were, all, all the time. So excellent, uh, thank you. Uh, another question, Gahulan, uh, question from the floor. Would you like to go ahead, please? Yeah, I had a question for David. Uh, David, um, just uh, out of curiosity, you know, most of the uh, automobiles are now manufactured in in countries like Thailand and, and other places. If those uh, automobiles are manufactured there and they, uh, uh, during the manufacturing stage, they will not know which countries that cars are going to go. Um, yeah, all those cars are going to come in with eSIM, but how are they going to be able to work with the local uh, service? Um, what sort of um, chipset or what sort of communication protocols do they need to have in those vehicles? Hmm. Uh, a very good question, um, Golan, and thank you. I think uh, this uh, plays in very well with um, sort of the theme of my presentation around um, standardization um, in, in technology, especially on 5G and IoT. Now, uh, obviously, um, if a module or a device or, or a modem um, that is built into a vehicle um, is not compatible with the network um, that the vehicle is going to be um, um, sent to in Australia, for example, um, then there will be challenges in 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 communications and interworking, etc. So, um, what we advocate is um, one um, uh, a, a global adoption or uniformity around um, what modules to be used in various different applications, what protocols those modules are actually communicating to the network. Uh, and, and what data format is it actually carrying? I think that's one. Without solving that, obviously, it just adds complexity in terms of global adoption of, of connected vehicles. Secondly, from an eSIM or connectivity perspective, then it is the same. If you refer back to um, sort of the, the, the stack, the framework that I'm, I was sharing in the presentation, um, um, connectivity will also need to be governed by a common platform. If we do that, that means uh, a vehicle that is being manufactured in, in, in China um, can actually have a China mobile profile, for example. But if the profile is connected to the same eSIM ecosystem that Australia is using, then by the time the car uh, is shipped to Australia and Gahulan buys the car, you turn it on, um, it will actually interrogate and negotiate um, uh, the most appropriate data plans from the most uh, fitting carrier or service provider in Australia, and hopefully that's Optus. Um, so that can't be done <clears throat> unless the platforms between 
the eSIM platforms between what Optus is using and China Mobile is using are actually integrated and interconnected together. No, that's a bit complex, isn't it, David? <laughs> it, 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 it is. It, Correct. It is very complex, but I think it, it, it only adds to the, to the reason why uh, this has to start. Uh, the discussion uh, needs to start now around making sure that there is a common framework, there is a consensus around protocol and interworking. Yeah. Thanks, David. Another question from the floor uh, probably relates more to the device rather than the uh, telecommunications system. But with the ability to stream such uh, rich content and the data that we can send over the network and the high bandwidth, how do you see the device memory being able to keep up with uh, the network capacity now? Because obviously we can transfer a lot of data and we're all going to be encouraged to stream uh, high resolution video and perhaps even 4K video down to devices. How do you see the technology within the storage of the device itself uh, managing to keep up, David? Um, we, oh, I believe that um, Dion, the trend will be moving into device simplification. That means instead of seeing what we see today with, you know, very powerful laptops and tablets and, and smartphones even, with its own processing, uh, a, a, a very high uh, powered CPU, um, we're actually seeing um, all the time because the cost of access in, uh, the, the cost of accessing a network, especially in 5G, um, on a on a on a per bit level, is actually becoming cheaper and cheaper. That means you can almost send raw data um, through the network through a 5G network because it allows you to actually send such large data and do the processing and storage uh, in the cloud. Um, that can mean two things. One is that. Your, the cost of the of your device will become cheaper because it's not so sophisticated anymore. It could just be well be um, instead of a, a phone that we're accustomed to today, it could just be a screen and a modem. Um, and a lot of the uh, smarts are actually done um, in the cloud. Uh, and that 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 is one of the promise of actually having um, a, a high bandwidth a capable network like 5G. Excellent, thank you. So we're going back to the, the old fashioned way of kind of a dumb terminal where everything's done externally from the device uh, because we can transfer the data so fast. That's a very interesting concept. Okay, uh, another question coming in from the floor. Uh, Gahulan, back over to you. Um, um, just uh, another question, David. So now what, how is Optus um, what are Optus um, plan to to monetize um, current 5G uh, scenario? How are they trying? How, how, what are the plans that they are putting forward to increase their revenue in the 5G uh, arena? Um, I think that there's um, there's not. Not a single um, answer to that question, probably. Uh, Gohan, Optus, uh, as well as any other carriers in the world, we are um, still at the very um, early stage of deploying 5G. Um, learning that there are some limitations, for example, uh, that we have learned from my presentation around uh, the, the, the coverage um, of the limited wave spectrum that is much more. Um, uh, much smaller than, than, than 4G networks, means that the cost can actually um, um, go so much higher in deploying 5G. Um, I, I guess not specific to Optus, but uh, uh, globally there's a number of approaches to actually monetizing 5G. Uh, one really interesting um, uh, concept is actually deploying 5G um, as a private network. So instead of what the telecom industry used to do, which is, you know, uh, we, we, we deployed the, the, the network for a whole country and then, it, then, then the users will start adopting and coming and then we eventually recover the investment. Instead of doing that, um, 5G can be much more targeted. So for example, um, if you have a factory or a plant that needs um, um, 
that should be highly automated, highly smart and highly intelligent. Um, and in doing so, for example, um, um, technologies like 4G and Wi-Fi uh, will not be able to deliver a reliable uh, control for robotics application. Um, you need 5G. So instead of building 5G everywhere, um, then we can build 5G where the demand is. For example, in manufacturing plants, in um, uh, building 5G to transport or control, for example, electricity grid uh, as a smart grid. Um, that means the investment is actually built towards uh, a particular um, a use case or particular purpose instead of more public use of network that we see today at 4G. All right. Thank you, David. Okay, a question that uh, I'm looking forward to answer, having this one answered because it will be a useful answer for me when I uh, keep being asked the question as well. Often I'm asked uh, by people, I'm sure you are as well, to explain the difference between uh, 5G and the 5G that I've had in my home for many years. I'm often asked by people who say, hey, this 5G technology, it's, it's all new and it's not released yet, but I've had 5G at home, uh, obviously referring to their Wi-Fi. Just interested in what your explanation between uh, those two answers would be, please, David. Oh, that, that is a really good answer, uh, question and, and, and definitely questions that I, um, I get a lot as well. Um, I, I, I think the way I answer that is a, a, a typical engineer, so it might be over elaborate, but um, there's, there's a number of um, misconception around the use of G. Um, the 5G in Wi-Fi refers to the frequency that it's transmitting which is a unit in gigahertz. Uh, typical home Wi-Fi operates in either 2.4G or 2.4 gigahertz or 5G or 5 gigahertz. Um, the, the G that we use to explain 5G as a new cellular wireless technology it comes from the word generation. Um, so 5G is the fifth generation of mobile cellular technology. Um, its predecessors are 4G, which is the fourth generation, 3G, third generation, all the way to 1G, which is the first generation, uh, which is an analog mobile system. Um, and the other sometimes uh, more confusing use of the word G is also, uh, it's being used to explain the speed. So, so um, if I have a, a one gigabit per second um, NBN fiber to my home, sometimes people say that actually I have a 1G um, um, NBN at home, and my office has 10G. Um, but that refers to um, the throughput of a system, which is in gigabit per second. Um, so again, just to add more confusion, um, uh, apparently the world loves to use the letter G. Thank you, David. That was an ex excellent explanation. Gahulam, uh, back over to you. The other question that I had uh, for David is, um, is uh, which or is, is Optus participating in any of the um, current um, uh, organizations that are actually putting forward the standards for 5G? So I, uh, is there, is there an, uh, a consolidated team where the different service providers are coming together to look at how the 5G standards need to be in Australia? Um, globally, the um, leading organization for 5G standards are um, 3GPP um, um, in terms of defining the actual protocols on 5G RAN and 5G core. Um, Optus itself is represented because we are uh, part of Singtel Group and Singtel has a representation in, in the body. Um, we also use our partnership ecosystem in order to um, um, deliver or request specific uh, changes to the standards that we require because every network is different. And we do that from a variety of channel um, uh, we use our uh, network equipment uh, vendors, partners to actually, uh, which is part of the GPP, um, 
as, as well as, um, uh, for example, um, from Australia, uh, aligning to um, AMTA and MCF. Uh, in Australia itself, uh, um, MCF, which is part of AMTA, um, we are actually participating in terms of defining uh, 5G adoption and standard on in building systems, for example. Um, and that is actually in collaboration with other members of the MCF, uh, which is um, um, service providers in Australia. Uh, with AMTA, we've been actively involved in discussion with um, ACMA as well, um, um, as well as, uh, for example, local councils and government in terms of agreeing on a 5G deployment code. Um, that we'll be able to actually use to accelerate a uh, rollout of 5G. Thank David and for such a good explanation. Thank you. Okay, uh, a question relating that I've been asked uh, a lot lately is probably many unfounded uh, accusations around health concerns with the 5G technology so i think it's probably only fair that we maybe try to touch on that um obviously lots of comments around uh, how the technology is and its higher frequency may cause issues uh, just interested in in a, a kind of a, a correct technical response to some of those concerns that people might have around the health issues of uh, a proposed 5g network yeah um i, I think the way um the, the, the better way to um, so, somehow de demystify that concept, which is uh, very wrong, um, is the fact that um, uh, 5G and other um, frequencies used in cellular network communications they are, are non-ionizing. Um, so um, the the spectrum that is used in 5G, which is predominantly 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, all the way to the wave um, are actually the same frequencies that were used for uh, 3G and 4G technologies that we've had for decades ago without um, um, uh, proven um, health implications. Um, that's one way. Uh, secondly, in Australia itself, uh, deployment of any licensed spectrum, including 5G, 4G and 3G before that, is very well regulated and governed under SCMA. Um, we need to comply with various different level of emissions um, of, of, of the radio frequencies before we are even being able to actually activate a site. Um, so it is in itself um, a very well run um, and, and very well governed uh, uh, by SCMA um, and, um, and it is inherently built into the license conditions um, that every carrier has. So I think there's, there's, um, there's multiple layers of uh, safety protections um, applied to deployment of cellular technologies, um, even um, uh, from the fact that the spectrum itself are actually non-ionizing. Thank you, David. That's excellent. It's nice to uh, to clear up some of those those false uh, allegations. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we've come to the end of tonight's presentation on 5G standards for IoT. I hope that you found it very interesting and informative. I certainly have. May I take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us, either for the live stream or the recorded event. And I'd also like to acknowledge the people from the institutions such as Gahulan that have helped make this presentation possible for you tonight. In addition to, of course, David for his excellent presentation. So thank you very much once again. Um, please be sure to check out our links in the video uh, for any future events. And you can find our YouTube channel there with uh, recordings, etc., from previous events. Well, we hope that you will be able to join us again for our next presentations and um, please check the websites for when we're able to resume our normal physical meetings, which will be in Sydney CBD. Thank you again and please stay safe wherever you are. Thank you.